Hello listeners, welcome to Itihasa, an Indic history podcast and you're listening to episode 27 of the season Vijay Nagara. In the last episode, we looked at one of the most intriguing monuments at Vijay Nagara, the Great Stone Platform, which is also known as Mahanavami Dibba or Dasara Dibba that's located in the royal center part of Hampi. We explored in depth on the imagery covering the Great Platform and saw how the focus of the Vijayanagara artisans over a few centuries moved from a large collection of themes including all strata of the society to courtly life and celebrations. We had ended that episode with the conclusion that this multi-layered platform clearly had a strong royal purpose and served the role of elevating the Vijayanagara emperor in front of his subjects, vassals and foreigners alike. The great platform and its grand imposing structure was a very potent symbol and a platform to radiate not just the king's divine status but also his political, military and economic prowess. Today, we will switch gears after the last three back-to-back episodes from the architecture and art series. And we will look at some fascinating aspects of religion, culture, real politic and fashion in the royal court of Hampi. I can assure you it will be an illuminating episode. At the end of it, you will most certainly come out with a lot more clarity about what made Vijayanagara tick and how it thrived in the age of sultans. Let us begin the episode with an Arabic proverb and then a question. Quote, Eat what you like and dress to please others. Unquote. Did you know that not wearing a necktie was once punishable by law in America? Not wearing a necktie especially at a public hearing or the court back in 1800s in America was a contempt of court and seen as a disrespect for authority. Suits and neckties are in a way remnants of Catholic influence in the daily lives and conduct of people back then and probably even now to an extent, albeit in a subconscious way thanks to the scars of European colonization. I'm sure the listeners would be wondering why exactly are we talking about America, neckties and how this is in any way related to the 15th century Vijayanagara. There is obviously a connection which I will explain in a bit. Just like how a language can influence one's way of being and thinking, so does what one wears influences their way of being and thinking. Sandra A. Neeson A Dutch anthropologist has this to say about people in clothing. Quote, In a change of clothing, people express their response to a changing world. And they claim even create a place within that world. Many phases and many choices are represented in the laborious passage from national clothing to the sartorial proclamation of involvement in a wider and different social milieu. Unquote. If one thinks about it, this is a really interesting excerpt that so finely describes the role of clothing in how people fit into the world around them. People actually wear what they wear not to stand out. Rather, they do that to fit in to a bigger social identity. Many a times at the expense of a national or local cultural identity. I think a couple of pictures would illustrate the point and its essence really well. After all, a picture speaks thousand words. Do check out the show notes for the links to the pictures in question. The first one is a group picture of all the major leaders from the 2013 G8 summit that was held in Ireland. And the second one is a group picture of all the leaders from the 2017 G20 summit that was held in Hamburg, Germany. You can even see India's Prime Minister Mr. Narendra Modi wearing a safari suit in the second row in between the Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe both wearing suits. The difference between both the pictures is pretty obvious. In one, you have the world leaders not wearing neckties, a traditional symbol of hierarchy and ceremony. They opted instead for a casual look like never before on the world stage and it then had backfired big time in public perception, at least in the western world. And the same leaders 
rushed to abandon the casual look the next time. They went back to the traditional full suit with a proper necktie, as illustrated in the second picture. One might think that this attire was a simple personal choice made by the participants. But the fact of such a universal abandonment of formal dress seems to point in an opposite direction. This forced sloppiness was not well received, sparking comments on the vulgar dress not only from the BBC but also from Vanity Fair. In short, the most powerful leaders on the planet had to wear what was most conducive to affect a positive perception about them, in not just the eyes of the other leaders but also the global audience. They had no choice as perception is everything and it can be ignored willfully only at one's own peril. Just like an open shirt, a tireless leader is perceived as inspiring contempt for his own authority All, and he also comes across to others following the dress code as someone who places his own comfort above all things and not to be taken seriously. And now that we set the stage, let's transport ourselves back to the 16th century Vijayanagara capital, Hampi, and see how similar cultural forces were at play even there. As part of research for this episode, I've based it upon two main sources. One is a phenomenal research paper published in 1996 by Philip B. Wagner, who is a well-published author and a professor in the domain of history and archaeology. And the next source is C. Sivarama Murthy's Vijayanagara Paintings, published in 1985. When Robert Sewell, the pioneer of Vijayanagara history in the 1900s, inaugurated the modern study of this South Indian empire with his classic A Forgotten Empire, he characterized the state as a Hindu bulwark against Islamic conquest, thereby formulating one of the most enduring axioms of Vijayanagara historiography. And Philip B. Wagner in his research paper puts forward a solid thesis to refute this axiom and tries to turn the whole narrative on its head. While anyone who has heard the Foundation series of this season would already be cognizant of my personal position on this. I won't go into that again right now in the interest of time. Instead, we will explore in depth the theory and narrative put forward by Philip Wagner first and then put forward my own thoughts on that. In his research paper, Philip Wagner questions two core assumptions or narratives out there. The first one being the Vijayanagara Empire was a bulwark against Islamic conquest and the second one being the existence of a Hindu state like Vijayanagara led to the preservation of Hindu institutions and customs in South India. Quite in contrast to the areas of Northern and Western India which had come under Islamic influence in the 13th century like we saw in the earlier episodes. While Philip acknowledges the powerful hold of Robert Sewell's assertion which still continues to exercise a powerful influence on the historiography of South India, he also claims that the pattern of political conflicts and wars in South India between the 14th and 17th centuries cannot be understood in terms of a simple Hindu-Muslim conflict. Philip continues to argue that, on the contrary, the Hindu culture at Vijayanagara was in fact deeply transformed by its interaction with Islamic culture. This is again, in my opinion, Philip stating the obvious. As and when two diametrically opposite cultures meet or clash, there is an inevitable tendency for either both of them or either of them to be transformed in some way or the other. But then, if one moves beyond the restricted area of religious doctrine and practice to examine the secular culture of Vijayanagara's ruling elite, one begins to notice and acknowledge the extent to which Islamic-inspired forms and practices altered the Indic courtly life in the Vijayanagara period. Philip Wagner proposes instead, if one accepts as legitimate those cultural changes that have been distilled through contact and interaction with the outside world and alien cultures, instead of viewing them as abnormal discontinuities threatening the internal coherence of a native traditions, development, then the Vijayanagara period can only be viewed 
as an exceptionally dynamic and creative era in the history of South India. Let me explain that in a simpler way with a crude analogy. It's like one saying, just because a fellow Indian is sitting in Hyderabad or Delhi sipping a Starbucks coffee while wearing jeans and expensive Nike Jordan sneakers, you don't have to necessarily look at such a person as an anomaly or abnormality who has trashed his own native culture in favor of a western one and instead look at it as a proof of you living in a dynamic truly globalized and free world where your cultural identity is in threatened at the same time philip actually makes a very strong point and it's difficult to disagree with it in a way but then again it's much more nuanced than that as we shall see further in the episode increasingly in the recent decade or more scholars have begun to recognize the islamic influence behind a number of characteristic cultural manifestations of the vijayanagara period in areas such as military technology and strategy and political and administrative institutions and also the material culture of the court It is at this point that Philip introduces an interesting concept called Islamicization to fill what he calls as a vacuum of acknowledgement from the earlier researchers for not paying enough attention to how these Islamic inspired forms and practices were symptomatic of a far reaching process of systemic change in the elite culture of late medieval South India He points out that while many prior archaeologists have acknowledged in the area of architecture the presence of Islamic style in the forms of the royal or courtly monuments of Vijayanagara but even premier researchers like George Mitchell have stopped short of viewing these architectural developments as part of a larger process of fundamental cultural change and it is this process of cultural change which philip refers to in his paper as islamicization to the listeners who are hearing this term for the first time i have to stress that this word shouldn't be confused with another similar sounding word islamization they both are very different in their meanings which we will see now in detail and it's important to understand this difference first to appreciate philip's interesting thesis and the resulting narrative about Vijayanagara first islamicization refers to a political strategy by means of which the indigenous elites attempt to enhance their political status and authority through participation in the supposedly universal culture of islam second this participation is done through the adoption of certain islamic cultural forms and practices which given the political nature of the process largely related to the broad sphere of secular culture as opposed to the narrower domain of formal religion as such islamicization has nothing to do with religious conversion to islam or even syncretism it's very clear and definitive in the case of vijayanagara there is no evidence of any syncretic or conversion phenomenon with respect to the state of religion within its domains This is despite the fact that the material and political culture of Vijayanagara's elites underwent islamicization to a remarkably high degree. And finally, islamicization does not necessarily occur at the expense of indigenous cultural traditions. In other words, when a given cultural form adopted from the Islamic world has a functional counterpart already existing in the native culture the import does not necessarily replace the established form in all contexts it is only replaced in some contexts for example in courtly audiences and receptions where political military and trade representatives from the larger islamic world are present a given islamicized form may be used where a symbolic appeal would be politically advantageous whereas use of the native forms will likely continue in other domains like hindu ritual performance and private lives where such an appeal would be irrelevant or even counterproductive 
resulting in delegitimization of the participant. Let's now look at an revealing excerpt from a 1970s published article written by Marshall G. S. Hodgson, who was an Islamic studies academic and a world historian at the University of Chicago. Quote, By the 16th century, most of the East Christian, Hindu and Theravada Buddhist peoples found themselves more or less enclaved in an Islamicate world where Muslim standards of taste commonly made their way even into independent kingdoms like Hindu Vijayanagara or Norman Sicily. Unquote. So, in this excerpt, Marshall's statement encourages us to view Vijayanagara in a proper world historical perspective as but one of many states located in the periphery of an expanding Islamic civilization. The statement also emphasizes the fact that the acceptance of Islamic cultural norms could and did occur in empires or states which remain independent, like Vijayanagara and Norman Sicily, where never subject to political domination by the Islamic Caliphate or any of its successor states. Finally, it stresses that this cultural impact was in the area of secular culture rather than of religion. So when Marshall speaks of standards of taste or social and cultural standards, he characterizes these cultural phenomena not as Islamic but as Islamicate. The distinction is crucial for interpretation of medieval Indian cultural history. I also have to point out that this whole phenomenon of Islamicization wasn't necessarily a happy one. Instead, one might want to look at it as a willing compromise made by the non-Islamic world in achieving a larger political goal of the age or period in question. One of the most profound instances of Islamicization at Vijayanagara appears in the system of men's court dress. And it is on this phenomenon that Philip's thesis focuses on primarily. He tries to demonstrate how the traditional South Indian mode of dressing was largely replaced during the 14th and 15th centuries by a new one based on the use of garment types that had originated in the Islamic world. These garments were kabai, a long tunic derived from the Arabic Kaaba and the Kulai, a high conical cap of brocaded fabric derived from the persio turkic Kula. The thesis argues that this transformation, far from being the result of mere changes in taste or fashion, was a deliberately calculated act on the part of Vijayanagara's courtly elite and that it was closely related to changes in the political culture of the court. So the adoption of these alien forms of courtly dress is in fact paralleled by the appropriation of some aspects of its political language too, which we will see in detail in a bit. First, let us explore in depth the Islamicized dress kabai and the headgear kulai. The clearest and most detailed visual evidence of this appears in a painting from the Veerabhadra temple at Lepakshi in Andhra Pradesh that dates back to 1530 CE. In the painted ceiling of the temple's outer pillared hall or Natya Mandapa, there is a depiction of a group of male courtiers worshipping the deities of the shrine. Most of the figures in this group are clothed in an identical fashion with the white tunic that is called kabai in native literature and the tall conical cap of brocaded fabric as kulai. Please do check out the show notes for links to the corresponding images of these garments. In construction, the kabai is depicted as a tunic, characterized by long snug sleeves and a lower hem of variable length, which in some cases reaches as far as the ankles and in others stops at the knees. It's like a sherwani, with a large circular neck opening with a narrow turned-on collar 
and a slit in front that seems to extend down the length of the chest that seems to have been fastened with a button of some sort as for the color and decoration every kabai shown in this painting is made from a plain undecorated white cloth and the only accents are provided by the colorful sashes tied around the garment at the waist coming to the kulai that is depicted in the same lepakshi painting it is a high conical cap with a rounded peak up to 1 and 1/2 times the height of the head the lepakshi mural is a invaluable aid in understanding the form and decoration of the kabai and kulai but it does not permit us to identify the materials from which these items were made or to help us gain a sense of the extent and social context of their use and which is why the chronicles and the accounts of the foreign visitors and travelers to vijayanagara is crucial and it acts as a much needed complement to the pictorial evidence written accounts of south indian customs in the vijayanagara age have survived from the hands of arab persian chinese portuguese and italian travelers most importantly these texts and chronicles are marked by an attentiveness to descriptive detail rarely matched in the indigenous texts which more often than not pass over in silence the familiar realities of everyday life and this is very much understandable in the 15th century abdul razak samarkandi who was in ampi around 1442 to 1444 ce describes the contemporary vijayanagara ruler devaraya ii as wearing a tunic using the persian word kaba in the next century italian and portuguese writers describe the garment as a slender dress somewhat like a petticoat not very long and they describe it as shirts like with a skirt the portuguese traveler domingo pais in his chronicles records the name of the garment as kabaya in portuguese most likely transliterating directly from the kannada kabaya he even recorded that on one of the occasions the king gave cristova de figueredo a kabaya if you remember this cristova he is the same individual from the previous battle of raichur series so the king here would be shri krishna devaraya who is honoring him with this fine garment of kabaya as per the contemporary travelers abdul razak duarte barbosa and cesare frederick the material from which these garments are made is generally described as being of cotton silk or brocade also both pais and nuniz single out the king's garments as being a white silk cloth embroidered or worked with golden roses finally the recorded evidence suggests that there were both social and geographical boundaries within which use of this garment was restricted and this is clearly shown by the 16th century italian traveler ludovico di vartema who explicitly draws a contrast between the tunic worn only by the richer people and the dress of the common people who go about almost entirely naked covering only the parts of their shame or their private parts in short even though the kabai or kabaya may be understood as an elite garment in reality it was not worn at all south indian royal courts but appears to have been in prevalence at the royal court of vijayanagara and many of its vassals having said that it's worth pointing out that there were a number of small kingdoms and city states which thrived on the maritime trade and preserved their autonomy from vijayanagara and the evidence consistently suggests that traditional indic dresses remained the norm even at those courts this is very nicely portrayed in the chronicles of various travelers like abdul razak chronicler of vasco da gama and chinese muslim chronicler ma huan the zamoran or the ruler of calicut in 1440 ce is said to have been as naked as the other hindu subjects 
which translates to the fact that the ruler did not cover his chest and torso but only he covered his body waist down not surprisingly this was also the case in cochin and then in quilon quilon is the old name of ancient seaport of kollam which is 66 kilometers away from trivandrum and then in ceylon old name of sri lanka and even in maldives when the population was predominantly muslim back in 15th or 16th century itself the foreign travelers and chroniclers are also equally consistent in describing the 16th century vijayanagara emperor and members of his court as wearing a high cap generally stated to be of brocade which is clearly recognizable as a kulai the italian traveler ludovico di vartema states that the king wears a cap of gold brocade two spans long while domingo pais says of the ruler krishna devaraya that on his head he had a cap of brocade in fashion like a galician helmet the portuguese traveler domingo pais gives two further details first that these caps were worn not only by men but also by certain women of the court the maids of honor who wait upon the queens and that these women's kulais are decorated with flowers made of large pearls philip wagner in his thesis claims that both the kabai and kulai are noteworthy innovations in the medieval south indian fashion scene during the vijayanagara period and here i have to point out that while i agree with the innovation claim when it comes to the kabai and which is a tunic dress in the medieval south indian fashion scene i am not fully convinced when it comes to the kulai headgear being a radical innovation you see india has had a rich history when it comes to headgears or also known as pagris or turbans dr g s ghuria an expert in costume history analyzed that the female wore pagris without any projections but the male pagri was projected vertically frontal or sideways however later on male turbans or headgear became of appropriate size nevertheless with the passage of time the headgear underwent distinctive changes in its style shape and color even today in india we see pagris of myriad shapes and shades of color temperatures which inspire an awe amongst the onlookers since time immemorial indian pagri or the headgear has remained a central force of cultural heritage and acquired several signs and rituals around it in ancient indian sanskrit literature we find ample reference about the pagri which was used as a symbol of veneration socio culturally pagri or the turban has been held in high esteem and in the vedic period during the rajasuya yagna one had to wear this headgear in a particular style around 300 bc we find references about rishi apasthamba asking his students to take off their headgear while approaching their teachers this was practiced evidently as a token of respect to the teachers in the medieval era this headgear was epitomized as a sign of honor no one was allowed to enter the royal court without wearing one though as a symbol of respect bowing or taking off before the emperor was in vogue in some cases to lay down one's hat or turban before the king or anybody signified one's absolute submission thus donning these turbans or hats had been a sign of respect right from the royal courts to the religious institutions as well now here is why i say that kulai worn by the vijayanagara rulers was no radical innovation like philip wagner claims during the 6th and 7th century the pallava kings sported a conical variety of headdress which was very similar to the kulai that is being described in this episode so far this kulai headgear was nearly identical to the headgear prevalent in north india back then what it means is that 
cultural communication between the north and the south took place during this period and by the 6th century itself kulai style headgear was prevalent at least among the south indian pallava royalty in short contrary to the claims of philip wagner the south indian fashion scene in my opinion didn't had to wait for kulai to come uh, in the 14th century having said that one has to acknowledge the fact that with the ushering in of islamic rule in india the mode of headdress underwent a significant change and the persian and central asian influence was soon observed in the country's main fashion flow according to jamila brijbhushan in the muslim period the caps worn were of many shapes pointed with a boss at the tip conical with broad upturned brim triangular or pointed sometimes it was down shape with seams visible in the middle so you see philip wagner isn't entirely wrong it's just that he seems to brush aside the possibility that after the arrival of islamic rule in india maybe the headgear of the 7th century pallavas went through an improvisation which resulted in the final design of kulai there are also many instances of independent development of similar styles and designs across various cultures or civilizations either in technology or costumes without ever interacting with each other and it is this aspect which i feel philip wagner doesn't take into account fully to be fair to him he does mention in the footnotes that the ancient indians use the kirita or mukutam extensively and that they were in generally made of fabric unlike kulai but of metal set with precious gems another point worth mentioning is the form and shape of kulai worn by the vijayanagara rulers nobility of the royal family if you look closely resembles a lot with the cylindrical headgear of god vishnu lying over the thousand hooded serpent adisesha and this depiction of vishnu's headgear was certainly no medieval invention that was inspired by the 15th century version of kulai which in turn as per philip wagner was supposedly was an inspiration from the persian kula it might be that these two designs were so similar that it was only natural for people to refer to them in a word or language that both the islamic and indigenous people could relate to and with this we will end this episode here and resume it in the next one so in this episode we explored philip wagner's research paper which argued that the vijayanagara rulers in the interest of real politic at some point embraced the islamic forms of costumes like kabai kulai and few other aspects of the islamic political language without actually becoming islamic we tried explaining this phenomenon with the term islamicization which as we saw was very different from islamization in the next episode we will look at an aspect of the political language that was imported by vijayanagara rulers and the polity to help them navigate and thrive in an age of sultans in medieval india i sincerely hope the listeners enjoyed this in-depth episode on culture and politics of vijayanagara if you did please hit the subscribe button and leave a rating and a review wherever it is that you're listening a huge thank you for taking the time to listen to the show i hope to see you soon in the next episode till then this is narendra vikram your host and narrator signing off hope you have a great week ahead